Hi, this is TapCat, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. Now, the original concept for this video started when I got contacted by a Twitch streamer who goes by the name of Backseat Streams. He's relatively new to XCOM 2, he's playing on veteran difficulty, and he wanted an expert to assess his progress and kind of let him know where he stands in the game so far. I can only imagine that all of those people must have been busy, though, because somehow he ended up contacting me. Uh, but I am going to do my best to offer some kind of critique on the state of his campaign. But I realized two things almost as soon as I started working on this. Uh, the first is he's very likely to finish this campaign successfully without any help from me. He is in some danger on one point, and we will address that in the video. Uh, but at the same time, while I'll be offering tips on how to finish this campaign, I would actually suggest that they'll probably be more helpful if he has any interest in moving up to commander difficulty in his next campaign. And that leads me to my second realization, which is that if these tips could help him make that jump, and they may just be useful for viewers who are in the same position. I hope so anyway. All right, all that said, join me if you will, <laughs> me and Dre, uh, while we check out the campaign in progress of Backseat Streams. So the first thing I want to look at is the memorial. He's lost six soldiers so far. Three on one mission. So Operation Starblade, obviously a bloodbath, and that was a bad day. And then there's three other missions where he, where he lost one soldier each. For someone on like their second or third campaign playing on Iron Man, I've seen a lot worse, a lot worse. And so here's what I would say. In terms of performance on the combat map, there's a pretty strong indication that he is capable of going the distance because the early game is by far the hardest. And if you can get through that and only lose a handful of guys, I think you have a pretty good chance to go the rest of the way. But I do have some concerns, including one way the game could be lost. But let's start before we get to that. Let's start by going into the armory. So again, let's try and prioritize. And I think we can all agree that the top priority has to be the fashion game. Here we have the kind of psycho goth look. <laughs> I like it a lot. I'm sure um, the other soldiers give Bunny a wide berth at the base, but that's okay because she, she takes care of business out on the battlefield. Really like the use of the green face paint with the green armor and a nice use of texture and pattern on the armor too. This man knows his stuff. Sky blue plus earth tones. Come on. This is, this is next level stuff right here. I, I, I am so proud. Purple and gray, one of the great underrated color combos of all time. But look at this skirmisher. I mean, he's got the hat. He's got the pimp daddy hat, the tiger stripes. How are you topping this? This is amazing. I love that look so much. I actually like this spark too. I like pretty much all of them. Here we go. <laughs> this one, I don't know how anybody can see this and not smile. It's like the Joker gone more crazy, if that's possible. So, bravo. Now that we've uh, gotten the important stuff out of the way, let's waste some time talking about, uh, you know, the actual builds and uh, the bench and all that. So before we get into builds, first of all, let me just say, uh, one of the things he told me, each character, each soldier is named after a viewer. And then that viewer is picking the, the abilities for that soldier. So he's not doing that part. He's just following what they say. So fair enough. Here's the first thing that jumps out at me. It's fantastic that there are six colonels at this point in the campaign. It's also good to have four majors under them. But it gets thin really quickly after that. 
The biggest concern to me is we have a colonel sharpshooter and then nothing until you get down to lieutenant. So that's an issue. And I have to say that um, in general, the bench is kind of thin. And you can see that right now, all of the higher level guys for the most part are tired. And you're kind of in a situation where if you got to go on a mission, there's not a lot of high level soldiers to bring. And the only way to fix that is to start bringing these guys on missions and start resting them, whether they're tired or not. What I would recommend that Backseat does is I would try and discipline myself to not bring these guys on missions, period. Or bring one. Like bring the Reaper to scout or something like that. But really try, like, look, bring the Templar on a mission, bring the Spark on a mission, bring one of the captains or two of the captains and bring Jackal in particular. But, you know, some of these guys, I'm not saying bring a roster, you know, of six of these dudes against gatekeepers and dromedans and the like, you, you just get his ass kicked. But you can mix in some of the high to mid-level guys and two or three, you know, sergeant and up and start getting these guys experience. And once the lieutenant is a captain and the sergeant is a lieutenant and so on, this will start getting some, some traction, you know, pretty quickly. Now, I mentioned that the viewers have been the ones calling the shots on the builds. And for the most part, I'm not going to nitpick them. Okay. Um, there are, I didn't really see a lot of them that looked horrendous to begin with. Um, I was afraid they might troll them intentionally, but it looks like they're actually being nice and they want their characters to succeed. So that's good. Uh, here's one that I would do some work to, though. Reapers are potentially one of the most powerful classes in the game. This one is not really specced for success. So this is ironic because I absolutely adore Grenadiers. And um, this is the most Grenadier Reaper I've ever seen. All but one of the Claymore abilities have been picked. And then she has Shredder. She has Hollow Targeting. The problem is this. A Reaper is not a Grenadier, and it doesn't function well as a Grenadier. Shredder and Hollow Targeting are abilities that you use on a soldier who will shoot first. You want them to get rid of armor. You want them to make everybody else's aim better. This is who shoots at an Archon first, who shoots at a Gatekeeper first. But Reapers, when they shoot first, come out of shadow. And Reapers are the best scouts when they're in shadow you could possibly have in the game. What they're really designed to do is to take abilities like Silent Killer, where as long as it's the kill shot, you can shoot every single turn and have zero risk of coming out of shadow. If you take blood trail, and blood trail only takes effect if you're not shooting first, you help make up for the fact that their rifle sucks. They have the worst base damage in the game. You kind of want abilities like blood trail and silent killer, and not so much with this. So, Obviously, you need to talk this over with your viewer, but I would gently suggest doing a respec, getting rid of these two, and taking a couple of the really good classic Reaper abilities. You do have Banish, which is great. Um, Annihilate's good, but it's expensive, and we can see you know there's no points for that. But anyway, that's my two cents on the Reaper. The other thing that I'm going to say, I mentioned how much I love Grenadiers and regular viewers of my channel know this. Um, the biggest thing that's missing here overall, um, taking, you know, this group of abilities is fine. There's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But 
Hollow targeting, I can't recommend this enough. It's it's so helpful. Since you already want to shoot something like a gatekeeper or a sectopod first to get them shredded, why not hollow target them and make everybody else chance to hit better at the same time? You've got rupture, which is also a great alpha strike attack. Go the whole nine yards and take hollow targeting. So the other thing that I saw is not related to a build issue. It's just on the loadout. Specifically, having the flamethrower as the heavy weapon on your spark. Flamethrowers, it's not just that I don't particularly like them. I think there's a pretty broad consensus that they are the weakest and worst heavy weapon simply because literally any cover just stops it. So a lot of times you won't get any damage in. Also, robotic enemies are immune and so many of the late game enemies you are concerned about are robots. There are two shredder guns here, so I would strongly recommend swapping out the flamethrower for the shredder gun. And again, when you're fighting things like gatekeepers and sectopods that have so much armor, uh, this thing is just really helpful, particularly compared to the flamethrower. But I think at this point, we have spent enough time in the armory. So let's talk about the thing that I'm most concerned about in his ability to win this campaign. And that is the Avatar Project. Because this is just the one way you'll straight up lose, I guess, outside of an Avengers defense mission. If they complete this project, it's over. Uh, is he in imminent danger of that? No, he is not. However, they're getting up there. And you can see most of the alien facilities are locked. So what I would try to do in particular is get to this one because you can see it has three pips and the others, including the one that's unlocked, they all only have one. So if this clock starts getting up here, these don't buy a lot of time. So I would try to get here. Now, I didn't realize it at first, but there is an issue with that because if we come out to here, and we look at the facilities that have been built, you may notice that the resistance comms is not here. We have a laboratory, which isn't really needed. We have a workshop that isn't really needed, uh, but no resistance comms. So we're at seven of seven. I guess there must have been some sort of rewards either from scanning missions or covert actions that got them to seven. Uh, but that's a really dangerous place to be. By the way, here's another thing I noticed is that there's an unassigned engineer. So putting them to work would be good. Um, I would definitely try, like, let me just see what this does. Okay, so that got us down to eight days. And in eight days, if it were me, I would be building resistance comms. Here's the thing though. You don't necessarily need more contacts to slow down at least the avatar project. So let's talk about how to do that really quick. In the resistance ring, you don't have, he doesn't have any right now, but at times there are things like getting facility leads. There are uh, opportunities to reduce avatar progress and so forth. So that's one way it can be done. In the research division right now, there is a facility lead that could be researched in one day. So that would open up a second facility that he could take out if needed. That alone, if it was me, would, would make me feel a lot better. Let's go ahead and talk really quick about research since I'm in here. So right now he's working on interchangeable upgrades and that's a perfectly fine research project, but I would also say it's a lot better earlier in the game than it is now. One of the reasons for that is two of the chosen have been taken out, which is phenomenal. Uh, one of them, 
I believe it's the assassin. He's already got the weapons for, and he can do the hunter weapons right now. So that'll give him two of his like six squad members that have weapons where the upgrades are locked in. They cannot be changed out. Once the warlock goes down, now that's half the squad. So how much interchanging are, are we actually gonna be doing? And while this project is being done, the hunter's weapons aren't being gotten. And the hunter's weapons are insanely good. He's got a sniper with death from above. Death from above, an okay ability when you use a regular sniper rifle. It'll give you free reloads and such. But oh my God, combined with the Dark Lance, it's basically God mode. So I would definitely say, don't really worry about interchangeable upgrades and a lot of these so-called breakthrough research projects that they love to throw at you. Focus on the high impact stuff. Get the hunter's weapons. There's a uh, psionic operative at the second highest level. Do the gatekeeper autopsy and get them an upgraded psyamp. Do the sectopod breakdown and get the improved gremlin. So there's some really good stuff just sitting here. It's low hanging fruit waiting to make the troops he already has better. And I would take any of those before I did this. So that's, that's one thing that could also be done. And then another area I would say, if we go to engineering, there isn't a lot in the proving grounds where I feel like there's opportunities being missed, but here's another, just talk about low hanging fruit, 30 supplies to get the hunter's ax. The hunter's ax is so good because it gives the ranger a free ranged attack every mission. And when I say free, I mean literally does not count as one of their actions for the turn. And because it's ranged, it really gives the ranger a flexibility that they don't normally get. Because usually they got to be crawling up someone's butt with a microscope to be able to hit. So that's really good. The other thing I noticed is, unfortunately, he has no talon rounds. He has done some experimental ammo. Only has one core left. So, you know, it is what it is. You could only do one of these. But... I would give it a try. I would spin the wheel and see what comes up. Hopefully he'll get lucky and get some Talon rounds. If he does the respec on the Reaper, those Talon rounds will really, really help be the cherry on top of the Sunday that makes that Reaper a genuine death dealer that lives up to her name. We're going to take a few minutes to look at combat now. I will tell you up front, I am not going to even try and do anything comprehensive. That would probably be an hour long video unto itself. So let's just try and cover some really basic concepts here that I think a person could work on and learn from over time, you know, if they continue to master. So as an example, we have a turn here where there's three enemies. One is a specter, one is a shield bearer, and one is a lancer. Of those three, the only one who is guaranteed to attack and try to do physical damage and put one of your guys in the morgue or infirmary is the lancer. The specter and shield bearer, on the other hand, are guaranteed to not do damage on that first turn. So when you're prioritizing enemies, definitely go for the lancer first. And just to be clear, his kill order is Spectre, Shield Bearer, Lancer. Now I wanna give him credit here because there's a point in the turn after the Spectre is dead where he does kind of go through that. He's thinking about killing the Shield Bearer. He checks to make sure he has some guys to take care of the Lancer. But here's the key point I wanna make. Most of those shots on the Lancer are not high percentage shots. And instead of just looking to see, do I have shots? And then going back to kill the lower priority target, I would just say, look, go after that Lancer first. Don't think you can kill the Lancer, kill the Lancer. Then you can worry about the Spectre. Then you can worry about the Shield Bearer because we don't really care if the Spectre and Lancer are dead. We don't care that the Shield Bearer is gonna put on a little light show and have a few extra health in the form of a shield that we have to burn through. That's fine. So this is actually going to tie in. I'm gonna cover another battle here really quick, but these two things are connected. 
So just put a pin in this one for the moment. So the next one, there is kind of a similarity I'm noticing here. So we start this turn and the ranger happens to be standing right next to a specter. And so since it's a flanking shot, he takes it. And as far as it goes, like that's a perfectly fine shot, but there's a viper right there. And no one on the squad is better equipped to kill that viper than the ranger. He's close enough, he could easily take a flanking shot, probably with a 100% chance to hit. So what that means is dodge comes off the table and with vipers, dodge is a real thing. And also, of course, you're not gonna waste the action by missing if you're at 100%. The other thing is between the specter and the viper, again, you really want the viper dead first. That viper can spit poison, do a tongue grab, shoot somebody. The one thing he won't do is waste a turn grabbing one of your guys only to get shot a minute later and then release, you know, your guy unharmed. Here's what I've noticed in a number of combats is that he has a tendency when the enemy's turn ends and his turn begins, it lands on a soldier. And if there's a shot, he'll take it. If it's a good shot in particular, doesn't necessarily always think about moving to the most advantageous spot and definitely does not always seem to have a plan for the turn. And this is really the crux of what I want to get at. If we take this turn as an example, I would definitely want to check and see what my odds are of killing the snake with the sword. If not the sword, you know, move in and take my best shot with the shotgun. See where that leaves me. If the Viper is not dead, which of the other squad members are best suited to get that kill? From there, we can move on to the Spectre and so forth. But before you start even making those moves, I would want to think about, okay, if the Ranger doesn't get the kill, who am I most likely to want to follow up with? And who are the one or two guys I most want to get a shot on the Spectre with? You know, who's got my blue screen rounds and stuff like that. So I'm not really suggesting you take 10 minutes at the beginning of each turn to come up with a detailed plan. There's too many things you don't know. You can get max damage or minimum damage. You know, you can have a 99% shot and miss. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong. But ideally what I would say is this, whether it has to do with killing a high priority target or maybe you're on the last turn of a timed mission and you really need to make sure you get that mission objective this turn. At the start of every turn, figure out somewhere between one and three, ideally one and two things that you say, before this turn ends, I must make this happen, period. And then go through your squad and at least try to get an idea of how you're going to do that. And of course, start working on that number one priority first. When you finish that, then you can worry about number two. The only other thing I'm going to mention in terms of a plan is this. Sometimes you have to get a little bit, uh, I don't want to say reckless, but you have to take some chances if you're going to make these critical things happen. If at all possible, you want to have a plan A where let's say to get that Viper, just a, as a hypothetical, let's say you had to move out of cover and that was the only way you could get a flank on him and have a decent shot. So if I don't get lethal damage when I do that, I've really hung a guy out to dry, right? So now my next question is this. Is there somebody with a grenade who can go after that? Or they have a stock on their rifle and I can get a guaranteed couple of points of damage. What can I do as my backup plan so that if plan A doesn't work, I'm not practically guaranteed to lose the guy, you know, at a minimum for a good chunk of time in the infirmary and possibly permanently. Because this is XCOM, bad things happen to good soldiers, but they happen a lot more if you put them in position for it to happen. Now, I've been critical up to this point, but I also want to point out, I watched a fair amount of one of his streams, and there's also some really good play in there. He had an encounter with the Archon King that I'm not really exaggerating when I say it was managed about as well as I could think to do it. Uh, he, he went out of his way to stack damage over time on the Archon King, which is, you know, very effective against alien rulers. 
set a sniper up with kill zone before the beginning of his turn so that every time the Archon King moved, he at least had a chance that she would be able to see and get another Overwatch shot in. Part of it was very basic, part of it was clever, but a really good mix, I thought, of tactics. And I didn't really see, I, I don't think one thing that he did that turn that I thought he shouldn't have, and there wasn't anything I thought he should have done that he didn't. It was about as close to a flawless encounter as you know I could think of. So I definitely see some real potential here if he keeps kind of sticking to the game and wants to learn and master it, I definitely think he can. A final verdict as it relates to Backseat Streams campaign is this. There's really only one dangerous flaw in his campaign, and that's the lack of resistance comms. Because if you cannot keep the Avatar project in check, you will straight up lose. Not being able to make contact with enough countries is, you know, arguably the biggest risk for that to happen. So it is possible that you could finish a campaign without building one. Using the resistance ring, story mission, some of them lower the avatar project progress and so forth. He might make it to the end, even if he doesn't build it. But the thing is you're really rolling the dice there on something that I don't know why you would feel like you need to do that. It seems a bit reckless to me. So that's really the only, you know, hardcore thing. All the other stuff we talked about, I don't believe would would stop him from being able to complete it. So can he finish this campaign? Is he doing well overall? Yes, I would say that he is. So the more interesting question in my mind is whether he could step up to commander in his next campaign. And I think the answer to that is also yes. Now, that leads me to the extension of the concept, which is what about viewers at home who may be playing on veteran? And what does it take for them to also make that jump? So let's just talk about that in really broad terms for a quick minute. We often describe XCOM as an unforgiving game. And in some ways, it can certainly be that. But I actually am going to kind of argue against that for just a little bit here. I'll take my own play. I, I play on Legend exclusively. And if I play back one of my missions, I could look at virtually every single turn and say, hmm, you know, that wasn't optimal because of this. Like I should have made this play or that play. And I could just tweak all kinds of little things. And yet I'm not losing a bunch of soldiers. I'm not losing a lot of missions. I'm still beating the campaign. Because the reality is even when you play on Legend, there is a margin for error built into the game. Now, as you move down in difficulty levels, that margin only becomes bigger. So commander obviously is more forgiving, veteran, and on down the line. Now, what I would say is, rather than XCOM being really unforgiving, is that it's demanding. It demands that you learn how to build up your capabilities in the Avenger so you can consistently field a squad that can keep up with the power curve of the enemies you face. It demands that you approach battlefield tactics with ruthless efficiency. The key to all of this is investing the time and energy to build up your knowledge of the game and how it works. The higher the difficulty you wanna play, the more you need to learn about these fundamentals and the more critical it is to put them into practice because your margin for error will be shrinking with each step up that ladder. Not everyone wants to do that. A lot of people don't even realize that they need to do that. But if you're watching this video, I hope there are some tidbits in here that can help open your mind to possibilities of how you can improve because this game is eminently beatable even at the highest level of difficulty. And there's no question in my mind that Backseat is capable of it or that you're capable of it. Good luck, Commander, and thanks for watching. I hope we see you next time.